I started out, as was indicated by Jack, it's a very humble beginnings. I don't know what that dream is that you have. I don't care how far-fetched it might appear to be. I don't care how disappointing it might have been as you've been working toward that dream. But here's what I know, that that dream that you're holding in your mind, that it's possible. Let's say that together, please. Say, it's possible. See, sometimes we can't say, I can do that. But what we can say, that it's possible that I can have my dream as we run toward it, as we work on it day in and day out. No one, ladies and gentlemen, could have convinced me when I started out just over six years ago working on my dream. And I want you to think about whatever your dream is. Because I was willing to take a chance, and most people won't do that. Most of the people that you talk to to try and bring them into the business, these are not risk takers. Most people have done all that they're ever going to do. They raise a family, they earn a living, and then they die. But people who are running toward their dreams, life has a special kind of meaning. And here's what I will share with you, that in the process of working on your dreams, you are going to incur, incur a lot of disappointment, a lot of failure, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. But in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. What you will realize is that you have greatness within you. What you'll realize is that you're more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine. What you will realize is that you are greater than your circumstances, that you don't have to go through life being a victim. As Jack indicated, I was born in Miami, Florida, in an area called Liberty City, in an abandoned building on a hard linoleum floor with my twin brother. We were six weeks of age. We were adopted. When I was in fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled, educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I don't have any college training, but I met a high school teacher who one day changed my life. I was waiting on another student, and when he came in, he said to me, young man, go to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. And I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter. Follow my directions now. I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. He said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that man, Mr. Leroy Washington, did something for me. He started planting seeds in my mind that enabled me to begin to dream as Dexter has been doing for you. And ladies and gentlemen, I started working on my dream. And most people don't work on their dreams. Why? For many years, I didn't. One is because of fear, the fear of failure. What if things don't work out? And the fear of success. What if they do and I can't handle it? The other thing is that most people, ladies and gentlemen, they get comfortable. They stop growing, they stop working on themselves, they stop stretching, they stop pushing themselves, and they end up becoming very cynical about life, and they throw in the towel on themselves, and on their families, and on their dreams. And the other thing is that most people don't feel worthy. What I'm doing now, I could have been doing years ago, but because I did not have a college education, because I didn't believe in myself, because I allowed other people's opinion of me to control my destiny, I didn't act on my ideas. So I applaud you for your dreaming, for your running toward your dream. I applaud you for believing in yourself because that's what life is about, stretching and challenging, looking for ways that you can begin to improve yourself. And ladies and gentlemen, as a result, of stretching out, of acting on my dream, and I don't know what that dream is for you, I can tell you that it's possible. 
No one could have convinced me that after just over six years, I would have my own book entitled Live Your Dreams. Just over six years, I would have five specials on public television. Just over six years, I've done motivational speaking for AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, Xerox, IBM, just over six years. I will now have my own talk show that will premiere on Monday, Labor Day. I'm saying to you, your dream is possible. Your dream is possible. But not only is it important that you believe and begin to know that it's possible for you to live your dream as you run toward it, but I've done something that I want to share with you called Choosing Your Future. In fact, I've developed a set of tapes talking about how to begin to create your own reality by choosing your future. And not only is it important for you to know it's possible for you to choose your future, but it's necessary that you work on yourself, that you develop yourself. It's necessary that you get the energy drainers out of your life, people who don't want anything. It's necessary to know that everybody won't see it, that everybody won't join you, that everybody won't have the vision. It's necessary to know that. That a lot of people like to complain, but they don't want to do anything about their situation. That you are an uncommon breed. You know, you have to know within yourself that I can do this. Even if no one else sees it for me, I must see it for myself. That's necessary. It's also, ladies and gentlemen, necessary that you be creative when you're working on your ideas. That you understand the importance of, of changing up of readjusting your strategies. Many times we can have a great idea, but if you're not advancing it in the right way and things don't happen, you become discouraged and think the idea doesn't work. No, that's not true. It's necessary that we become creative. I remember when I was in New York walking down the street and a guy approached me and said, hey, mister, can I shine your shoes? And I said, no, I'm in a hurry. I don't have time. I kept walking. Someone else said, hey, man, your shoes look cluddy. May I shine your shoes? I said, no, I don't have time. I'm sorry, I'm busy. And I was walking fast and many people solicited me for my business. And then finally, a young man stepped in front of me and he said, excuse me. And he started counting, 97, 98, 99, 100. He said, sir. I said, yes. He said, come here, please. I said, what is it? He said, today is my birthday. And every year, just to thank God for another year of life, the 100th person who passes by shoe shine stand, I offer them a free shoe shine. Would you give me the honors? I said, why, sure. I got up on the shoe shine stand, George, and I sat there and, and he shined my shoes diligently. And when I got down, I looked at him, they were sparkling. And I was walking away and I said, thank you. And I stopped, I said, excuse me, but how much do you usually charge? He said, only $2. I said, I tell you what, today's your birthday. Here's five, keep the change. He said, thank you. As I was walking away, looking in the opposite direction of other people coming, he started counting again. 97, 98, 99, 100. It's necessary that you be flexible, that you are always thinking of how can I improve this better? This is a customer-driven economy. It's necessary for you to always explore various ways in which you can improve the quality of service that you're providing for the people in your organization. I remember something a major company had talked about the extra value service they were providing for their customers. And the lady who had the news conference summarized it this way. She said, it's not our intention to satisfy our customers or to please our customers. Our intention is to amaze them. It's necessary if you're going to compete today that you look for ways to amaze your customers by being one of those individuals that keep your commitments, that keep your word, that's relentless. It's necessary you work with the people that you bring into your organization, that they see that you are a good example of a person to work with because you model integrity and determination and ambition and truth and honesty and the way in which you conduct business. The next step is, that is you. That is you that no one can do it for you but you. And even though you face disappointments, even though you will experience some setbacks, it goes with the territory. You must understand that. I remember I was playing a game with my nine-year-old son, John Leslie. 
And I beat him 10 straight games in a game called Connect Four. And finally, I said, John Leslie, I'm bored. I don't want to play you anymore. And I got up. I said, I'm ready to go to sleep now. And repeat out to me, please. Let's say to this together. It's not over until I win. John Leslie said, no, you can't go now, Dad. I said, why? He said, it's not over until I win. That was his attitude. We sat down and we played several other games. And finally, after the 11th game, John Leslie won and he got up and he yawned. And he said, I'm ready to go to sleep now. And I'm saying to you, what if all of us took that attitude after we face a rejection and a no or we have a meeting and no one shows up or somebody say, you can count on me and they don't come through. What if we have that kind of attitude? The cars repossessed. Nobody believes in you. You've lost again and again and again. The lights are cut off, but you're still looking at your dream, reviewing it every day and say to yourself, it's not over until I win. Life will yield to you. Now here's the next step. Repeat after me, please. It's possible. I can live my dream. It's necessary. I work on myself. Surround myself with winners. Become creative. It's me. I've got to make it happen. It's not over until I win. The next thing that's important to know, yes, it's possible that you can choose your future and direct the course of your life as you run toward your dream. It's necessary that you have goals, that you write those goals down, that you plan, that you think constantly of how you can begin to improve what it is that you're doing. If it's your presentations, if it's your recruiting skills, whatever that is, it's also necessary that you look for ways to always find a way to pull it out when everybody else thinks that you are defeated. That you've got to take personal responsibility to know that in order to become successful, you've got to make it your personal business to do it. But the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you that some of you already know that it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard changing your life. It was hard when just over three years ago, in the Penobscot building in Detroit, Michigan, where I was operating my business. And I fell on some hard times. And I was sleeping in my office. It was hard coming into the lobby. And the security said, excuse me, Mr. Brown, can we see you for a moment? And I said, yes. And I walked up to the counter and he gave me an envelope. And he said, would you mind reading it here? And I opened the envelope and the envelope was from management that said, this is an office tower it's not a hotel please do not sleep in your office and i said excuse me sir i said i just work long hours in creating my business i'm an entrepreneur and right now things are bad for me but they're not going to be this way always and i just asked for the opportunity to continue to operate like i'm doing i'm not trying to make this my home and it was hard coming through the lobby. And sometimes they would laugh. There's a guy talking about becoming successful. And look at him. He's bathing in the bathroom upstairs on the 21st floor. He sleeps on the floor. Him and two other dreamers up there. Look at him. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams, and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I said, God, why, why is this happening to me? I'm just trying to take care of my children and my mother. I'm not trying to steal a rock from anybody. Why did this have to happen to me? It was very hard. And here's what I want to say to you. For those of you that have experienced some hardships, don't give up on your dream. 
No one could have convinced me by holding on, by continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor, never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled educable, mentally retarded, but I kept running toward my dream. Don't stop. Don't stop. Stop running toward your dream. It's very important as you hold on to that dream. There are moments when you're going to doubt yourself. There are rough times that are going to come, but they have not come to stay. They have come to pass. It's very important for you to know that. Don't say I'm having a bad day. Say, so I'm having a character building day. It's very important for you to believe that you are the one to make this happen. I remember this high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington, at the end of school one June, it was just a few days before we were supposed to leave. And I just got my report card and it indicated that I'd fail history and I'd fail English and I would have to go to summer school. And I was feeling within myself that I was a failure, that I, I'm slower than most people and getting paperwork and, and I was feeling down on myself and, and, and very negative. And Mr. Washington was giving a speech to the graduating seniors and I was in 11th grade. And even though I wasn't supposed to be in there, I went in there because the speech he was giving, that speech was for me. And as he talked, my heart began to beat fast. Tears began to run by my eyes and, and I was in the back just listening to him because he said, and he was a very dramatic man. I still talk to him to this day. He said, as graduating seniors of Booker T. Washington High School, I want you to know that you are blessed and highly favored and that as you go toward the future, begin to know that you have greatness within you. And if just one of you here begin to envision yourselves as being blessed and highly favored to reach your goals, if just one of you capture the essence of what that means, that you have greatness within you and responsibility to manifest that greatness. That you can make your parents proud, you can make your school proud, you can touch millions of people's lives and the world will never be the same again because you came this way. And the students gave him a rousing standing ovation. And as he left the auditorium, I ran down the steps and I caught him in the parking lot. I said, Mr. Washington? He said, yes. I said, do you remember me, sir? He said, no. I said, uh, my name is Leslie Brown, my mother. She works in the cafeteria here. I'm one of the twins, Leslie and Wesley. I said, Mr. Washington, but you know, you know, I got these big dreams. You know, I like talking to people. I love people. I said, I, I want to work with people, and I got this dream of buying my mama a home. Could, could I do that, Mr. Washington? He said, it's possible, Mr. Brown. And as he walked away, I called him again. I said, Mr. Washington? He said, what do you want now? I said, um... I'm the one, sir. I said, I'm the one. You, you remember me, sir. I'm this baby Brown's boy. I'm the one. I'm the one. I'm the one.
And you must feel that. But that's why you're here. Because you are the one. And I remember when PBS first played one of my specials called You Deserve. One Sunday afternoon in Miami, Florida. I had some friends call him to tell him to tune in. And he watched the program. He called me in Detroit. And I answered the phone. And I said, hello. He said, may I speak to Les Brown, please? I said, who's calling? He said, you know who this is. I said, oh, Mr. Washington, it's you. He said, you were the one, weren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, and you were so crazy. I said, I know, but I'm rich now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to be easy. It was hard laying on the floor of the Penobscot building, looking out of the window, daydreaming, saying, Les, can you do this? Can you make this happen? I used to listen to tapes day in and day out about See You at the Top, my, my great friend Zig and, and, and Dennis Waitley and different other motivational speakers and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. And Dex is saying, don't let nobody steal your dream. I used to ask myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. You're the one. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. While you're here, and before you go back home to your respective cities and communities, write down at least five reasons on why you deserve your dream on why you won't give up, what's going to make you unstoppable, why you must be unreasonable, because logical, practical thinking says you can't do it today. But if you want to produce unreasonable results in your life, like living your dream and taking charge of your destiny, you've got to be an unreasonable person. You've got to be an uncommon person. So write down the reasons of why you're here. My first major goal was to buy my mother a home. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, what, what will reasons do, Les? Nietzsche said, if you know the why for doing, you can endure almost anyhow. What do you mean by that? If you know why you're doing something, when the hard times come and they're gonna come, when the disappointments and the rejections come and they're gonna come by the truckloads, your reasons will be your rod and staff to comfort you, to pick you up once again. I got a saying on one of my tapes, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back. Because if you can look up, you can get up. Let your reasons get you back up. I remember when I, I bought the home for my mother and she came out of the car. When I opened the door, I said, Mom, I think I know these people in this house. That was my first major goal. And then I couldn't conceal it anymore. I said, Mom, I got this for you. And as she went from room to room, looking at the house and saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. No one ever could have convinced me that this could have happened to me. And she looked at me. She said, Leslie, and you cost me so much problems as a boy. You were always into stuff. She said, No one could have convinced me that day when I walked in that house. And this lady was holding you and your brother. And she said, ma'am, I want you to promise me two things. And she said, what is it? She says, one, promise me that you won't separate them. She said, I want them raised together. I want them to know each other. I got pregnant while my husband was away in the war. And I can't keep them. Promise me that you won't separate them. She said, I promise I won't. I've never had children. I promise I won't separate them. And she said, promise me that you'll never tell him about who I am because if my husband ever found out, he would kill me. She said, I promise. And she said that she gave him to us and, and she kind of cried and she, and she was walking out the door and she looked at my doctor mother. She said, remember, don't you separate him. She said, I swear to God, I won't. I won't separate him. I'll keep them together. And she said, as I held you all in my arms, I never had any children of my own. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I knew with the help of God, I will do it. And ladies and gentlemen, 
My mother had a dream of having children and raising us. She didn't know how she was going to do it. You're going to be just like that. And some of you are already there. Well, you don't know how you're going to make this happen. But you just feel within yourself some way, somehow, with the help of God, I'm going to make it happen. Repeat after me, please. No matter how bad it is, or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got the right stuff. So, yes, it's possible for you to live your dream. It's necessary that you associate with winners, that you work your system, that you are relentless, that you never give up. It's you. You've got to take personal responsibility. You've got to make it your personal business to make it happen. And you've got to resolve within yourself that I can do this, that it's hard. But you've got to say, I'm the one. I'm the one to make this happen. I'm the one to become successful in this business. As you work to help other people to become successful, that feeds your success. But you know it's going to be hard. But find out what will make it worth it for you. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to make your dream become reality, the people that are running at their dreams know that it's possible that you can live your dream. That it's necessary that you're relentless, that you have a plan of action, that you are creative. The people that are living their dream are finding winners to attach themselves to. The people that are living their dreams are the people that know that it's, if it's going to happen, it's up to them. And they're resolving within themselves, it's not over until I win. The people that are running out to their dream know they're going to have hard times. They keep on running because they're saying within themselves, I'm the one, I'm the one, no matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. The people that are running after their dreams are the people that are hungry. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got to be hungry. And as you run towards your dream, I want to dedicate this to you that I love very much. I want to thank Dexter and all of you. It's something that I'm known by. It's on our tapes called Choosing Your Future, and it says simply this, that if you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it, if all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it, and if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose all your terror of the opposition for it and if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity strength and sagacity faith hope and confidence and stern pertinacity if neither cold poverty famish or gulf sickness or pain or body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want if dogged and grim you besiege and beset it with the help of god you'll get it